Hi, this is Dr. Goldkamp and welcome back to another episode of the Keto Naturopaths on YouTube. I want to go into talking about the most effective way you can implement a protein sparing modified fast. And I think the best way to do that is by doing an example. So first off, let's look here. This pretty much represents the population of the United States. And primarily the population in the United States is obese with low muscle mass. So why would you care? There's a thing called sarcopenia, which we'll get into later, not in this episode, but in another episode, which basically means you're under muscled. These are heavy people, so they're obese people, and they're under muscled. How do you get under muscled? How do you measure under muscle? Well, under muscled is about height and weight. It has little to do with age other than as you get older, especially over 50, 45 or 50, it is more difficult for you to create muscle mass and it's much more easier for you to lose muscle mass. So often they refer to this as sarcopenic obesity and they refer to sarcopenia as age-related muscle loss. I believe, um, per my experience, I've seen muscle loss or sarcopenia at far earlier ages, but for the sake of setting a standard, we will agree in saying it's really after 45 to 50, do you begin losing muscle mass unless you do something about it. So it's a natural tendency, quote unquote, natural tendency. And this has a lot to do, the loss of muscle mass has a lot to do with one's inability to burn glucose and one's inability to burn fat if one is fat adapted. Okay. So let's go on. This is something I hope you ingrain in your, your mind because we're looking at the muscle structure. So this person over here, they say obese with high muscle mass. This is a hypertrophied individual, has a lot of muscle, can burn both glucose and fat very easily on demand just walking down the hall. And it's something we need to work on. So how can we, where would a protein sparing modified fast have anything to do with any of these people? Well, one is, the objective of the protein sparing modified fast is preserve muscle and actually ideally create muscle mass, protein, muscle protein synthesis, which will at the same time help decrease the amount of fat. So we'll get into that. But this is the objective. Some of these individuals are fat in part to a large extent, because they are under-muscled. They cannot burn off. They cannot dispose of the glucose. And so think of muscle mass as the engine, as the incinerator of both glucose and fat. Glucose, if one is a carb eater. And so if they have a very small engine to burn things and they're taking in a lot of glucose, it's a mismatch. So therefore, the difference has to go into storage. And that storage is going to be fat gain. So as we've aged as a culture, not just as an individual, as a culture, we've stopped doing gym class. We've stopped doing athletic activities for the most part. We've become much more passive. Yes, I know people go skiing and they play tennis and so on and so forth, but we are far less active. Therefore, we have far less muscle mass. And the emphasis on being muscularly fit has been de-emphasized for a very long time. In fact, it's almost disparaging for people to look at somebody healthy and say, oh, look at how vain they are. No, maybe they're healthy because they like being healthy and they put in the effort of being healthy. So muscle mass to fat mass. Muscle is a consumer of glucose and fat. That's what I want you to know. And a muscle, a protein sparing muscled fat fast is one that keeps or increases your muscle mass, thereby helping you lose fat mass. So this is what we call a TOFI, a person who is sarcopenic, but they are not obese. That is, they have so little muscle mass. Now think of, when I say muscle mass, think of they have so little ability to burn fat and to burn glucose that their energy, for the most part, gets stored as fat. All right, so this is then on the outside, fat on the inside, tophi, under muscled. Here we're looking straight down spinal cord, and you can see that's their muscle. Here's 
and there's two different ways of being a tofi. One is having what they call subcutaneous fat, which is fat right under your skin. You can pinch your belly and you feel your, that's subcutaneous fat. But under your muscle, under your abdominal muscles, however thin they may be, is this down here. So this is vascular. This is actually a much more dangerous tofi than this up here. Subcutaneous fat is less dangerous, though it's, it's problematic for sure. And vascular adipose tissue, that, or abdominal fat under your musculature is far more dangerous. This is looking at a tofi person, or you might say a young versus old. This is the story. This is the false story, the false narrative of how we get old in this country. This is a young person with all their muscle mass, and you're looking down a leg, by the way. And this is an older person with less, less muscle mass. And now you think, well, of course that's normal. It is to an extent, if you do nothing, if you're very inactive, you will atrophy. Your muscle will disappear. And so you can say, well, isn't that what old age is? Is becoming less active? And therefore, isn't that the natural outcome? It is if this is how we're looking at life. But I'm saying it should not be this way. And the problem is a lot, once you can no longer dispose of glucose and fat well, you will then set up a very... Um, a dangerous situation, an immune compromised situation. So we can avoid that situation. Here's what it looked like, it looks like with somebody who avoided that situation, a 40 year old athlete, 74 year old sarcopenic, normal sarcopenic individual in the United States, let's say, where, we, where I live, and now a 70 year old athlete. So clearly the onus is on the individual to change this particular function. And by changing this, look at the 70 year old muscle mass. You assume it's on their abdomen and their arms, but this is the legs we're looking down. Is that the ability of them to have a very pre precise blood sugar and very precise amount of um, free fatty acids is exquisite. It's right in there. This person in the middle has all sorts of problems. Uh, we can go on with that. Um, and so that's important to know. This can be changed. That's step one. Let's see how to change it, okay? This concept of what it's like to be normal and be inactive and to lose your muscle mass, and it's become so common that it's considered this is how people get old. Uh, so I guess the word didn't get out to Jack Lane and a number of others that were strong up until the late 90s. Um, but anyway, what is considered normal is this thing called anabiolic, an, anabolic resistance, which is the inability to build your muscle mass. So to have a decrease muscle protein synthesis, MPS. Here's an example of that. And so when they eat, when you eat protein, which we're going to get into more, when you eat protein, that in itself will stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Eating protein, whole food sources of protein, will stimulate it doesn't always have to be whole food sources of protein, by the way. It will stimulate muscle protein synthesis, the building of muscle throughout the body. Okay, so here's what that looks like. The rate of MPS is does increase, but is somewhat diminished. And when they're not eating protein, it goes down to breaking down. So it's a net loss over time. Yes, it increases, but it decreases more when you're not. So the periods of eating Protein is very important. There's a key. The periods of protein, eating protein, are important. You can't be eating protein all day, obviously, but let's get into it. But this is what is considered old age. Anabiol eh, anabolic resistance. The inability or decreased ability to produce muscle mass. The first aspect of what you can do for either somebody you know who is older or for yourself if you're over 45, 50, and especially if you're a woman. It seems to be a little more accentuated for women than with men. That is, you can eat the appropriate amount of protein at least three times a day. So that will make a change in itself. That will increase your rate of MPS, muscle protein synthesis, making muscle mass on a regular basis. That's pretty easy to do. It's a freebie. So eating more protein, and when you think about it, just look at anybody who you know who is, let's say, 50 year over. If you need to think of an 80 year old, think of an 80 year old. What are things that you associated them 
right away. You go, well, they're, they're not that active. You know, they, the best they can do for is go for a drive in the car, <laughs> maybe stereotype. I know. Um, and at dinner, they don't sit down and eat a lot and you go, well, that kind of makes sense. They're not very active, so they shouldn't eat very much. But the reality is that not only do they not, they, they tend to eat less. This is true that they don't eat on a proportion basis enough protein. So they're eating much less protein than they did when they were younger. And they're much less active. These two factors are a big deal. And you say, well, it's diet and exercise. Of course it's diet and exercise, but we're talking protein specifically. Increasing the amount of protein at least three times a day, ideally four, and we'll get into even if you really want to go for it, what happens there. But let's just compare this is the norm that I showed you just a second ago. And it shows, well, yeah, you get a little bit of increase, but when you're not, when you're not creating, when you're not eating protein, it's just going to decrease. Okay, you have a greater muscle breakdown. Okay, so now when we lock in a the appropriate amount of protein, which is very easy to do based on ideal body weight, which we've done before, we'll get back to that in a second is that that in itself makes a difference. Okay, so whether you're talking about grandma or whether you're talking about yourself or whether you're talking about grandpa or whether you're talking about yourself, that's what you should know. How much protein do you need to eat on a per day basis? And right now, I'm not even talking about a protein sparing modified fast. I'm talking about how much protein should you eat in the course of a day? And when you think of it, if you just talk to this person, and if that person's yourself and saying, if I do nothing else today, I am going to eat the appropriate amount of protein. That is an important first step. I don't care what the rest of the food is. We can improve upon that and clearly have an opinion on it. But if you lay down the foundation, you've guaranteed yourself that you will have this amount of protein per day, that's tremendous. This will be a big, big deal. And so, Get that out of the way, and guess what? If you have this amount of protein, you're not gonna want all those other foods. That's kind of like the sneaky little secret that I'm not telling you about, but I'm saying lay that down, know that number, and then you're gonna break that number up into at least three different servings, ideally four. So we're not having more protein, we're taking the protein that we know, and that we calculated that we need, and we've done that calculation just once in our entire lifetime, and then breaking it up. Pretty easy to do, eh? Now here's what happens if we take that same person, grandma, grandpa, yourself, me, or somebody else, and say, let's add some exercise to it. Right now, we're gonna talk about weight resistance. That's why you see a, a barbell there. If we add weight resistance, look what we did. We didn't change the amount. We didn't change a calorie in this person's life at all. We simply introduced weight resistance exercise, maybe twice a week. What specifically, we will get into what specifically, we're just gonna call it resistance training at this point, twice a week. And now we've more than doubled their ability to make muscle mass. Clearly this is something that Jacqueline knew. Eat an appropriate amount of protein and work out. He worked out every day. Okay, so for an example, we're gonna use the men's chart. And this is right out of our course, it's a chart that I put together, but this is all research information. This is not some little uh, secret that I'm offering the world. This is already out there. And you can simply Google and you'll get probably four or five, not even formulas, charts that are similar to this, giving you the ideal body weight on a per height basis. Age, and there's even some that put an age into the formula, but they make almost no difference, as you'll find out when you play with such formulas. But anyway, so it's not a secret, it's public information. Um, we're just going a little further with this. So here is the chart for men. So we're gonna start with somebody like me, who's 5'10", and who's about to be 65. And so I'm in that category of supposedly somebody who's atrophied, begun atrophying maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Can you imagine? So this is the amount of protein that I need to eat per day. And that's basically two grams of protein per kilogram of body weight, or a simpler way of saying it, a formula that's been around for generations is one gram of protein per pound of ideal body weight. So that's where you get this. So 5'7", 162, I weigh about that more or less, actually a little lighter now. I weighed a lot heavier than that. And so what this is saying, here's my daily intake. Now if I can break this up into meals that are at least 30 grams, Right, so at least 30 grams, I will maximize my 
muscle protein synthesis. So I need to have at least, that's my minimum. So if I'm going to have um, five snacks a day, four snacks a day, at least that much, okay? So we'll get to what does that actually look like? But this is important to know. Not only your daily amount, but how much you break it up into three or four. And if you really want to go for it, five servings a day, it can be done. And you'll, but having that as a priority first, this is what the food is. You can start tomorrow by calculating this. I, I would go slowly if this, if you're really new to this, I wouldn't start tomorrow if you're 100 pounds overweight and never heard, heard of fat, adapt, uh, fat adaptation or anything like that. I would go more carefully. There are a lot of enthusiastic people out there, so that's why I say baby steps, brother, baby steps. Okay, to be fair, here's the calculation. Uh, on, I threw in a woman's height of 5'4", to say, all right, a woman 5'4", what's, what amount of protein would that person have to have? 125 grams, and that would mean the minimum they should have anytime they eat protein should be 22 grams. I know it's just a number to you right now, but get a scale and it ends up being real. So here's an example. I just went down to the kitchen and I saw what we had for leftovers. So we had pork loins last night. So I threw out a few pieces of pork loins, put it on a saucer, and I teared the saucer. So this is just the weight of pork loins, roast, roasted pork loins. We have 232 grams of roasted pork loins. Okay, so how much protein is in that? Okay, so let me show you how I do this. So now I know we have 232 grams of roasted pork loins. What do we do with that? Because we need to know how much protein is in that. So what I do, I've used chronometer for a lot of our clients and patients, and uh, it's free. So you can get this free. So I don't have a upsell here. And uh, this is what it looks like. So you basically, you know, you have a gold, that's $5 a month, or you get the free version. We do the professional because we use this to look into other people's accounts as they're as we're working with them. So we want to look into, we're going to go to foods and we're going to go to um, search foods and we're going to put in pork loins. Since I've been here, I know exactly where it is. We go down there, we select it then shows us what is in that exactly. This is just to blow it up, make it a little easier. So what do we do? We, just to review, we weighed the food, our whole food source of protein on a plate. It was 232 grams of pork loin. Uh, we went to the food tracking app. In this case, it was chronometer. And now what we did is we looked it up and it says for every three ounces, which equals 85 grams, we have exactly 24.3 grams of protein in a roasted pork loin. So we have 232 ounces. What does that mean? Well, here's what ounces are to grams, should you want to know. So we simply did the math. 232 grams of pork equals 66 grams of protein. So 66 grams, here's what I'm supposed to have, at least 30 grams per snack and 162. So that's about a third of my entire day's protein. So three times six is 18. That's a little more than a third. Or I can get two snacks out of that. So that's how I calculate that. And so here's just other sources you could use for your protein sparing modified fast. I hope that helps. We'll go live in the kitchen. We'll say, hey, here's how we do that. But it's you just have to do that once. You don't do this every day. This is not a scientific experiment. It's saying, how much protein do I know? Know that and stop guessing it. I thought I would end on this note is that if you can help anybody who you know is either inactive or let's put it in the category of 45 or old, older, more women than men, and help them focus on the simple fact that they need to eat a specific amount of protein per day and you can help them calculate it. If you did nothing but that and help them think of protein first, and they can have whatever they want after that, but protein first, and they have to get that part in, and make it a deal for just 30 days you do this. Just 30 days you do this. Protein first. We're not even talking about protein sparing modified fast. The value of having the appropriate amount of protein per day, and then breaking it up if you want to, to four servings a day, is incredible. You will completely change somebody's life for the remaining 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of their lives. So I hope you will join me 
to get this word out, but it is vital to say the least. So till next time, bye-bye.